What's up, y'all? This is Chitty Bang, and I'm on the Renegade Millionaire Show, the podcast that profiles entrepreneurs, founders, and CEOs. Join us as we go one-on-one inside the hearts and minds of some of our generation's best and brightest. And now, introducing your host, my friend, Sun Group Wealth Partners Managing Director, CNBC and Forbes.com contributor, Winnie Sun. Well, hi there, and welcome to the Renegade Millionaire Show again. This is your host, Winnie Sun, coming from LA's TuneIn Studios. As you know, I'm a financial advisor and managing director at Sun Group Wealth Partners in beautiful Southern California. So I'm really excited about our guest today. But before we get there, I, I thought I might share an interesting fact with you. Did you know there was, a, there was a study about compulsive hoarding? That's actually more prevalent than researchers originally thought. Hoarding disorder occurs in an estimated 2 to 5% of the population. This is a really big deal. And there's nobody, anytime you talk about Hoarders, hoarding, or even the word hoard, one name comes to mind, and that is my guest today. I'm so honored, excited to welcome Matt Paxton to the show. Welcome, Matt. Thanks for ha- thank you for having me. Well, you are Mr. Hoard, right? <laughs> yeah, it's it's turned in that way. I tell you, it's it's not a career path anybody uh, goes out to set. But uh, yeah, I'm the I'm the guy that does everything about cleaning up the fancy homes in the country. Yeah, and we were just talking earlier before we started tape here that I I know that everybody who watches your show ends the show a little bit cleaner because you said people yeah. a lot of people after they watch your show go clean their house. Yeah, I think it's very a lot of reality shows. You know, like I'll watch The Biggest Loser mm-hmm. and I watch and I say, well, I'm not so bad, and then it motivates me to go to work out or maybe watch my <laughs> diet a little bit. And I think Hoarders does the same thing. I mean, people, we know about 20% of the people that watch it, they watch because they have, they really deal with personal hoarding either themselves or a family member, so they're really looking for advice. And the other half, we just watch it because it's, it's, it's kind of an interesting train wreck, but it still makes us feel better about our own lives. Yeah. And as far as the TV business goes, we're just glad people are watching. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, this is a big population we're talking about. Between 5 to 14 million people in the U.S. are compulsive hoarders. I had no idea. Yeah, I mean, the stat I use on that is we're right in the middle of an election cycle. And, you know, we think about how much we talk about immigration. Mm-hmm. Well, there's only 11 million illegal immigrants in America. Wow. And there's 10 to 14 million hoarders. Like, it's a big issue. That's a big number. Yeah, it's wow. a very big number. I think hoarding should be a political topic right now. We should call yeah, Donald maybe not. Trump. It's not as exciting. Yeah, <laughs> I definitely don't want Trump talking about hoarding. <laughs> yeah, right. It's, uh, you know, it's something that affects everybody. And I want to really quickly say what matters here. No one like sets out to be a hoarder. Right. It's not like a choice. Right. Like something bad happens to you, mm-hmm. and then you start hoarding. It's so different than someone that like they lose their job, they lose their partner, and then they start drinking. Right. right. But we, we don't know why people go to why their brains go to drinking. We don't know why the brains go to gambling. We just know that they do. And it's the same thing with hoarding. They just happen to go to stuff. But all of them are looking for their happiness and self worth mm-hmm. in something else. And that's what a hoarder's doing. They're just looking for their happiness and self worth in stuff. I know. And I, I was hoping you could share your story with us. I mean, this is amazing. So you started Clutter Cleaner in 2006, and you were helping um, your own grandmother with her home, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, I'll, I'll even back it up a little more. Believe it or not, I went to college to be an economist. Mm-hmm. Okay. I was actually an econ- I worked for the Federal Reserve. I was an economist for them. And then I was an economist for Caesars Palace Casinos. And uh, at 24, I lost my dad, my stepdad, and both my grandfathers wow. in about uh, 12 months. Wow. And I just went on a bender. Like, I lost everything. And I was really, really sad. Mm-hmm. And uh, living in, literally living in a casino in Las Vegas. Oh, and wow. uh, and just and just couldn't hold it together. And so my life got a little derailed, and I, and I had to kind of start over. And I was mm-hmm. helping old ladies clean their attics. And I was helping my grandma. Mm-hmm. And I was personally going through some grief counseling mm-hmm. that I needed to go through. Mm-hmm. And at the same time I'm doing that, I'm helping my grandma. And I realized, wait a minute, she's sad just like me. Mm-hmm. And so my little, and, and a lot of entrepreneurs talk about their aha moment. Mm-hmm. But for me, it was cleaning my, my grandma's basement, and we found a golf bag. And she started telling me this great story about my grandfather and that golf bag. Aww. And that, to me, was my home. I was like, oh, wait a minute. This isn't about stuff. Yeah. This is about the emotional attachment. And I started my business that day. By the end of the week, I had helped a couple of her friends. And it was really not meant to be this big. You know, I now have 65 locations around the country, and I'm a, 
I'm a you know a very sought after speaker and all that stuff, but it was not meant to be that way. I mean, what I was really trying to do was just kind of help my grandma and then trying to make a few dollars. Yeah. And uh, it's amazing how in 10 years it, it, it's, we've come a long way. Oh, you've come a long way, my friend. I mean, mm-hmm. th- I, but I love this line that you said. You know, we all think she's crazy, but she's awesome. She's totally normal. And Quarters are awesome people. They're fascinatingly cool, awesome people that something bad has happened to them. Right. And that's, that's, that's how they cope with stuff, right? Yeah. It's their comfort yeah, I, level. I cope with, I cope with, uh, with alcohol and drugs. Right. No different. No different. Mm-hmm. In fact, you could probably argue that my stuff was worse. Yeah. I mean, a, a hoarder can't help it. They don't want to. It's just theirs is so visually messy mm-hmm. that it's easier for us to judge them. Right. Right. I mean, we've seen your show. We've seen you find some pretty icky stuff. And you find oh, some yeah. pretty cool stuff. But, yeah, it, it, it's crazy. Well, 65 locations. How, did you, how do you manage? You are one busy man. Well, I got smart. Instead of franchising or doing corporate owned, I partnered with a very big national partner. Okay. And so I partnered with Service Master Restore. And I now train their franchise. Okay. And so I have 65 locations with, a, with an existing huge company that had 800 locations. So wow. I was able to cherry pick their best franchise. And now we can offer hoarding, specialized training, hoarding cleanup mm-hmm. in pretty much any location in the country. We can get there within two hours now. And that was wow. a business you know, more of a strategic decision I made three years ago Mm -hmm. uh, that was really smart. I'm so glad I didn't try to franchise. I'm so glad I didn't try to to, to build it on my own because I would have failed. There's no way I would have been able to help. And I'm now able to help a lot more people Mm -hmm. because we partnered with an existing successful business. And you're so brilliant in so many ways because you not only do this for a living, and a lot of people run very successful business, but you are smart enough to go ahead and pitch this show. Let's talk about your journey to do that because that's something that I know people uh, listening to you are just in awe of, that you had this company, you had this idea, helped your grandmother, but then you ended up with this this show that people can't stop watching. Yeah, I, I knew what I was doing was special because our clients would cry, my employees would cry, and we're like, there's some emotion here, like this is cool. Mm-hmm. And I really knew I needed to get on TV. Now, this was pre, uh, this was really before the big, uh, reality boom. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, I mean, MTV still had a couple, but but most, re- I mean, Survivor was on, you know, in, in American right. Idol, but that's about it. The, 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 the many, many small shows were not on yet. Mm-hmm. And I started, I actually went on, I went on um, Facebook, I think I had like 30 followers, <laughs> you know, just friends <laughs> from college. And I went on and I, and I said, does anybody know anybody on TV? I want to try to get on TV. And I tried and tried and tried for weeks. And someone said, hey, there's a guy on Oprah that is organized, and he's talked about hoarding. So I found him online, and I just kept putting, I mean, for about a year, I kept trying to meet someone. and never really got anywhere. Uh-huh. And I got in touch with this guy, his name is Peter Walsh, he's since become a mentor and a good friend. Um, he was on Oprah, I met him, we talked about working together, It never that never worked out. And then he got asked to be on, on this show, Hoarders, on, on A&E. And he couldn't do it because he was contractually obligated with, with Oprah, her network. Mm-hmm. And he said, I can't do it, but this guy in Virginia won't leave me alone. Why don't you call him? <laughs> and it was literally, he was just passing it off. It wasn't, I mean, and they weren't even looking for talent. They were just looking for some houses to clean. And so it's not luck by any means. Right, um, of course. But I pounced on work. the opportunity. Yeah, I pounced on the opportunity when the luck presented itself. That's And incredible. I think, you know, I tell everybody, I mean, you got to have 10 irons in the in the pot because one, or two, 10 irons in the fire because one's going to end up hitting you. Completely does, agree. You gotta, you got to pounce on it. Yeah, and if you're just looking for one, it ain't going to happen. It's not going to work. Right. You were diversifying yourself by making sure everybody knew who you were and what you did. Yeah. So I mean, my business clutter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my business clutter cleaner. At one point, we were a recycling company. At one point, we were a senior moving company. At one point, we were a a uh, just a, a basic cleaning company, and we always adjusted. We liked the hoarding, right? Um, but it took us five years to figure out how to make money on it. And the first three years, we we, did, we were a moving company half the time. Yeah, because I can imagine. Because I can't see most people thinking, "Hmm, if I create this company to help people declutter, I'm gonna ma- I'm gonna have 65 locations." Because you know, many businesses would would fail because there wouldn't be enough customers. But this was smart. yeah. I mean, and, no, and none of my clients want to pay for my services and none of my clients want to admit that they have a problem, you know? And so we, we knew it was kind of like first time I heard the uh, puff daddy get interviewed and he said, man, I was telling, I was selling tapes and CDs to people that didn't have any money. 
Mm-hmm. You know, and so he said, "You got to, you got to sell my lifestyle." And so for me, I knew not that hoarding is a lifestyle, but I knew I needed to get on TV and I needed to show my compassion side. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. to be honest, I mean the the uh, the TV show was not exactly a revenue maker the first couple of years. Of course, I mean I was some dude that cleaned up poop for a living. That mm-hmm. wasn't cool. You right. know, what I did do well was I strategically personalized myself with the order, and that's just how I do business. I I, I speak very candidly. I speak to them as they're my, as if they're my grandmother or my mother. Mm-hmm. I speak to them as they are my friend because they really are my friend. By the time you see me on TV with them, I've spent three or four days with them. Right. And so right. the rest of the world was being politically correct. I was like, nope, I'm going to tell like it is. Right. And right. that's what the viewer identified with. And that's why I was able to stand out and, and, and it become successful out of the show. Only because I did what no one else would do, which was drop the PC and just keep it real. And just keep it real. Keep it raw. Yeah, so this is interesting. So I, I actually had thought that perhaps you were the one who came up with the idea and pitched the show, but that wasn't the case. The show was going to go into production, and they just needed someone really good, and, and it just happened to be your specialty. They were good at it. And I had luckily planted enough seeds on the Internet mm-hmm. that when they started to look for me, they found me. So, I mean, I had a couple YouTube videos I'd made myself. This is you know, seven years ago, six years ago, when they were looking right. to make the show. Right. I mean, you got to whatever your viewer is doing, you got to make yourself an expert. Mm-hmm. And if you're just copying someone else, who cares? Exactly. What's unique about you, what makes you uniquely better than the rest of the world, and run towards that and focus on that. And, and no offense, if you're not unique and you're not different than the rest of the marketplace, I find something else to do. Exactly. you're probably not going to stand out. It, it doesn't mean, you know, there's a difference between quitting and strategically stopping. Mm-hmm. Strategically stopping is changing pivoting because you're not going to be successful mm-hmm. and, and that's what i encourage people to do that's incredible this is this is this this I, i'm like in awe right now because this is so true <laughs> it's not just it's not just cleaning up that cat and boot it is a lot of strategy behind we did what we do exactly but it, it's so smart because it was all planned out and it just goes to show you you can't give up you got to keep by divers- diversifying yourself and working and trying and pushing and this is goes back to what I always tell my team. It doesn't matter how good you are at what you do. If the outside public doesn't know that you exist, you essentially don't exist. You do, exactly. Right? Exactly. 100%. Yeah. 100% agree. Yeah. And you have completely shown that in, in your journey to this. So now the show is Hoarders Family Secrets. It's on the Lifetime channel. And yep. So I know that, and I thank you, because I know you're between tapes and you're busy as can be. Where where are you right now? I'm actually in, uh, I'm in Oakland, California, and I just walked off the stage. I just taught 150 insurance adjusters 10 minutes ago, and I walked off the stage, ran behind to a private office, I'm doing an interview, and I will literally grab a sandwich and then get right back on stage two to four and teach another 150 insurance adjusters. Wow, goodness. You and know, then I'll go, to, I'll go to Phoenix tomorrow and start filling a beach, so. I mean, wow. you got to hustle why it's a pile of time. That's hustle, right. Hustle, hustle, hustle. Because when it's gone, it is ghost town time. Right, and you got to work it while you're popular. Yep, period. Yep. For real. I do every, I mean, as long as there's a quality interview, I'll do it. As and long as there's a quality speech, I'll do it. I mean, I, yesterday I gave a speech to six people. Yeah, Today I know. I'll do, I, three, I, I'll do 300. You never know. But, but, if, but if it's the right guy or the right girl, it just it takes worth one. talking to those six people. You yeah. never know. It just takes that one meeting. We really need to get I mean, together gave, one of these days. I gave, this is amazing. Yeah, I was next time in LA, I'll call you. Literally, I have given speeches for years for free. Because if, I'm, if someone's already covered my travel, mm-hmm. if someone's already covered my travel, why wouldn't I do it? Exactly. You never know. Exactly. You never know. Yeah, you know, that, that's true. You know, Wing Lam, is a, the CEO of Wahoo's Fish Tacos, is a friend of mine. He told me this. He says, I'll always do it as long as I know I'll have a good time. And... I say, well, you know, if you if you think that way, I, I can't see why other people don't feel that way as well. But that's what differentiates the great from the, you know, not mediocre, but, you know, that, that, that keeps them humming along. So Yeah, you, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not a bazillionaire yet. I mean, I'm, I'm a break even here. I've paid all my bills now, <laughs> which is really cool, yeah, you know. Yeah, that's and good, I'm, huh? I'm doing fine. I'm putting a lot of money away. But, like, you know, I, I, I'll keep going until it's so, no one will is willing to listen to me. <laughs> I mean, when everyone's like, get off the stage, dude, we don't care, that's when I'll stop. But yeah. until then, I'm not, I mean, I'll talk to anybody. And I have, like, like, I have fun. If I'm on stage talking, I'm going to have fun. If I'm making a difference and helping somebody, I'm going to have fun. Yeah, of yeah, course. If I'm just there for the cash, I got I to gotta ask myself, why am I here? 
I don't think I don't think you could do cash. that. I don't think it's in I your don't, DNA. I mean, I, I, yeah, I suck at that. I mean, so if it's just for the money, I'm not going to be good. So mm-hmm. I, I really don't do much just for the money. Me too. I try to go and I try to really, I try to just, I try to educate and I try to help. And make and a I feel difference. Like the money, the money, if I make a difference, the money will come. Yeah, hug a person, and, meet and, a person, love a person, and it, everything yeah. else will come back to you. But yeah, and it, I yeah, completely and it agree. Has. Mm-hmm. I mean, my, I've told this story in the past. Like my cell phone, the first time Hoarders went on air, mm-hmm. The very first episode, mm-hmm. my cell phone had been turned off by by uh, by Verizon because I hadn't paid my bills in three months. Oh wow! I mean, I'm literally airing my very first time on TV, and my phone won't ring because I hadn't paid my bills. And I called Verizon and I begged them. I said, and I said to the kid, I said, "Do you have a phone?" Because <laughs> my mom's gonna finally have a chance to do something. Aww. She's never had that chance. I was like, if she calls me, here's that ding ding ding. I just oh. be devastated. And the guy, he laughed. And I got a mom, I hear you. He goes, I'll let you receive phone calls, but you can't call out. Aww. I had to beg Verizon to let my phone ring the first time I was on TV. And by the end of the week, I, I had, had some jobs, and I turned it in. I was able to pay my bill. I mean, I don't want people to think that, like, I was killing it. You know, I, mean, I literally had to beg just to get a phone call after being on TV. I know. And people, I mean, that, that, that's something that's very interesting because people always ask me, Nick, like, because I run a financial services firm and people always say, well, you're yeah. on CNBC and you write for Forbes, so you know you got business coming out of your ears. I'm like, you know, that that's not true. People know who you are, but you have to work for every dollar, no yeah. matter what you oh, do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you had to borrow money from your mom or someone just to get to the on first taping on CNBC. That, I mean, I, I remember, like, we drove one time to close a big deal because we didn't have enough money to fly there. Mm-hmm. We drove four, drove 14 hours to a fish because I did not have enough money to fly there to close a big deal. Yeah. And that's just part of it. It's part of hustle. But you're, you're willing to do it. You know, though you, you have, we work, uh, this is the beautiful part of it. If with hard work, anything's possible and you're a complete mm-hmm. illustration of that because yes, you are extremely charismatic and you're so lovable to talk to, but you worked your tushy off. Yeah, I mean, you're if you're just personable and your effort doesn't back it up, mm-hmm. I think you fade away. Absolutely, like, you gotta be personal, and then you also have to be the hardest worker. Like I, I dare anyone to outwork me. Yeah, not possible. I feel that way too. Physically, not possible. I dare you. You'll fall over and exhaust. That's right. And I'm not bragging. I'm not bragging. That's just my theory. That's yeah, how hard I work, and I always will. Yeah, and just that's just what you do. It's the only way to be successful. Yeah, and it feels good, you know. I don't know about you, but I feel good when I go home and I like, literally just lie down and fall asleep because you know you work so hard. I can't even watch, remember the last time I watched TV. Well, not just I, except for your show, <laughs> but yeah. like you know, we don't have time to watch TV because there's so much to do and so many people to meet and so much impact to make. So I've carved out. I will say this: I've carved out time for Orphan Black, my new favorite show. Oh. It is, uh, Absolutely incredible. Okay, and you, to totally watch this disapp- now. you totally disappear. You're like in their world, and it's a total vacation. And I love it. It's an hour long. And I, I think I've tried to, I will say this year, I've gotten a little bit better at turning it off. Like I now turn off on Saturday. I'm totally with my kids, my wife on Saturday. Aww. And I don't check email. I don't even turn my computer on anymore on a Saturday. And, and, and that's that's come a long way. I mean, I used to have to work every, every Saturday and every Sunday morning. And I mean, so just to have a Saturday off with my kids. And to be able yeah. to really be present, that's that's success to me. That's awesome. Yeah, you know, success to me is dropping my son off myself to first grade. Makes me, nothing makes me happier. The best just, feeling yep. ever. <laughs> I just put my oldest. I just put my oldest on the bus to kindergarten last week. Oh, yeah. it was the fact that I had a home in a neighborhood where my kid could get on a school bus. Mm-hmm. That was amazing. Like that was like you know people are like, well, what did you buy with your first million? Buy a Ferrari? No, man. I put my kids to school. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the greatest, the greatest feeling in the world. That's yeah. awesome. And you found a good school in a good area. Good school, and I bought a swing set. I remember when I got interviewed for some like millionaires, and they were like, "What's the most money you ever spent on something?" I was like, "Man, I spent three grand on a swing set." Oh yeah, like, that, that was really that's crazy. a pretty pimp, like, that's a pretty pimping uh, swing set though for two thousand. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a pimped out swing set, but they're like, "That's the most boring answer we've ever heard." <laughs> I was like, "Sorry, man." That's where I spent Sorry, my that's money. reality. That's for my kids. Yeah, no, I like, love it. I love your answer because that that's awesome. So, what do you got? What do we, we? What do you have to look forward to? What do, What can we follow you on? Well, we've got, um, follow me on, on Twitter at I am Matt Paxton. You can follow me on Instagram at I am Matt Paxton. Uh, you can go to I am Matt Paxton.com. 
Um, I'm doing a ton of public speaking about hoarding education all around the country. You got any other places on my schedule? Uh, we're finishing up six of orders. I've, I've got 15 episodes that have not aired yet. Uh, Lifetime will announce when that's coming. I think it's early winter. Uh, we've got some really emotional shows this year. I mean, we've really opened it up, bringing the family in. Lifetime's been really great bringing us back uh, and putting them on Lifetime. They, they brought the family in, and we're we're seeing that instead of just focusing on the gross and just focusing on the shock, uh, they're letting families talk, and we're seeing more of the why people behave with you, why do people hoard, and what's the story behind it. So mm-hmm. it's honestly, I mean, I, I've never cried, and now I'm crying all the time on orders. <laughs> I love that. So they're yeah, telling more of the personal story, which is nice. Yeah, yeah, it's great. I mean, the more we do it, the, be- the better. Mm-hmm. And um, I tell you, it's just, I'm really, it's funny, we kind of found our second win when we went to Lifetime. And they really just said, go back to help people and film it. And it's been really, really nice. And I think it's neat that we, one reason that's why the show has survived on reality, mm-hmm. if you just are copycat and try to do what the networks want, mm-hmm. um, the show just doesn't really become anything. But the viewers really still love our show because we're actually showing real. I think we're one of the few reality shows that's actually real. Yeah, it's really we're honest. We're just family. Very honest for helping families. Mm-hmm. The cameras are rolling. Well, and, uh, you're pretty awesome too, though. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm lucky. I'm in a place to shine. I'm able to help people, mm-hmm. which makes me look good. Um, you know, if I was on The Apprentice, I don't know how good I would look. Well, no, so, but Matt, I don't completely yeah. agree with you on that. I think television is, in a lot of ways, like alcohol. It just basically shows you who you truly are. So I think television shows you to be a really, really incredibly wonderful person. I think that's just that's just who you are. That's Thank you. Well, I would say, say, if you're not a confident person and you're not sure of who you are, don't go on reality TV. <laughs> right. You got to be really solid in who you are and what you do and what you mess. If you, if you are totally at peace with who you are and what you're going to do, mm-hmm. then you'll, you'll shine on reality. Yeah. I mean, you know, look at look at Omarosa. Yeah. That's 10 years ago now, man. She yeah. still kills it. You know her name. She's amazing. She had a brand. She had a mission. She knew what she wanted to do. doesn't matter if I liked what her mission was. Mm-hmm. She's a machine. And right. She's memorable. And she's made a nice little career out of it. Right. And so there's people like that that, that can, you know, Bethany Frankel, same thing. You can say yes or no, but that girl's a multi-millionaire. Right. Because she was absolutely confident on what she did. Absolutely. It can be a great platform or it can ruin you. One of the two. Right. Right. Absolutely. So your your house must be squeaky clean. No, I have three sons, five, four, and two-year-olds. Uh, my house is a disaster, and we made the decision. I'm so glad you asked that question. It was a perfect last question. I believe in having a living house, not a perfectly clean house. Oh. And my wife and I had to make the decision to have happy kids that clean sometimes or just unhappy kids that live in a perfectly clean house. Mm-hmm. And we don't believe a perfectly clean house exists. You should yeah, enjoy your house, live it clean on Friday night. That's what we do. That's what we do. And that's perfect. That really is. With that, a huge thank you, Matt Paxson, for being on the show. Wow, what a pleasure. This has been just... Hey, thank you. This is a great show. I really appreciate you including me in it. It's such awesome. a good gift. Yeah, and definitely, let's connect on social media. So this is Winnie Sun. I'm at Sun Group WP. The website is winniesun.com. And we are very active on Twitter. So let's definitely connect. And Matt Paxson, everyone, thank you so much, Matt. Talk to you next time. Hey, thanks so much. Thank you.